I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sandy Roll. Trustee Rashames. Here. Trustee Levy. Here. Trustee Gould. Here. Trustee Widener. Here. Trustee Faust. Here. Thank you. Uh, part of this board met in closed session and no actions were taken. Uh, do we have approval of the minutes from. Uh, do you want to separate the minutes? That's what, I don't think we need to separate them. Yeah, we were all present for all of them. So, yep. uh, approval of the minutes from September 25th, October 9th, and October 18th. Uh, I move approval of the minutes for those dates. Second. All in favor? Passes 5 0. Thank okay. you. Approval of the agenda and the consent agenda. Agenda, consent agenda is presented. Second. Second. All in favor? Passes by vote. Okay. Uh, communications. This portion of the agenda is available to the public to address the board on any issue that is not on the agenda. Maximum time for allowed, allowed for any speaker is three minutes. Uh, LSEA, CSEA, people wishing to address the board, I have no cards. Uh, correspondence. Okay, uh, Board Superintendent Communications. Uh, would you like to start this time, Joe? Um, that was the work study. Okay. We talked about, well, we reviewed the um, site plans. Thank you very much to the principals. It was a very productive meeting. All right, well, I was at the same work study, but I had the same opinion as this. It was um, very, very productive. Um, I actually typed up a list this time, so looking at my calendars there. It's California Math Forum meeting in Orange County. I have um, come back recharged about um, mathematics and common core and that kind of stuff. But interest-based bargaining, we spent the day um, learning about interest-based bargaining with a refresher there, and that was um, a, ve a very good, very productive meeting. Uh, we uh, attended with um, Richard and is it just you and I at the um, uh, CSBA meeting mm -hmm. and um, heard some good stuff and Ann Campbell talked about the I zone and so all good information there um, saw the Cabr Ca Cabrillo um, talent show <laughs> excellent as I was walking out the door a third grader got on the piano and I had to stop she was amazing Woo. And then the next night, it was the Sunset Ridge Boo Fest, which was a lot of fun. And um, uh, we closed the school down that night. It didn't really go well. <laughs> and uh, spent the morning with SIFA at a Silicon Valley Network meeting. So, busy, busy. Uh, so I went to the interest-based bargaining uh, training and the work study, and thank you again to the principals for a fabulous job, and uh, Pacifica School Volunteers um, uh, Math Lunch and Learn uh, with SIVA, which was, uh, which was great, and the, uh, and the Belmar Scare Fair. Which uh, hopefully will become a, <laughs> an institution. Oh. I, 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 they did a, you know, like for the first year, I think they did a really fantastic job, and everybody worked so hard on that. They really did. It was, it was fun. Uh, let's see. I, I went to the uh, study session, and other than that, I completely bailed out on every single other event that I could <laughs> schedule for because. But you have an excuse. I yeah. have a good excuse. I became a, a grandfather last week, so. I have, pic I have pictures. <laughs> Some just arrived for my wife who has not returned home. Uh, so I did that. And sadly to say, he doesn't live in this district, so there's no ADA in the future. Uh, <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> he could move on. He could. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There must be something else on the. <laughs> okay. So I, I uh, also attended the interspace bargaining training uh, and the PSV uh, Lunch and Learn uh, with SIVA, which was nice, uh, the School Board Association meeting, uh, the work study, uh, and then 
this last Sunday I had the uh, opportunity to go over and uh, cheer on Wendy for the uh, Rotary Bowl a ton. Uh, so I got to see a lot of people over there. They had a really good turnout for there. And then uh, also I went to uh, the Ability Awareness Day at Ocean Shore, which is uh, always an incredible event. But this year was kind of special for me in that um, one of the presenters, uh, I was at Ocean Shore when he first started and, and once upon a time was one of our more fragile diabetics in the district and this year he was actually a, a presenter telling kids about diabetes and how the pump works and, and all sorts of things like that so it was really neat to be able to see him make that transition. So having had the opportunity to attend many of those events as well, yes rotary polling was just fun 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 so next year if people want to do it you need to sign up. What was your score? People, uh, we won't go into that. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't let us practice. So I well, that must mean they didn't let you use a little air bump. Either. <laughs> but we did have a good time, so it was really fun. Um, the one thing that I do want to, to talk about, because we won't have an opportunity um, uh, later or at the next board meeting, is we are developing and we'll be having our community forums on November 4th and 7th. I believe flyers have been uh, put out. It's an extremely important meeting as we will be talking about how we're shifting to the Common Core, so we call it our new directions. Um, also the fact that we are in now a new funding uh, cycle, new funding formula, so it's, it's very new to us. We're working really hard at preparing for a presentation um, work study for the board and hopefully Many of the um, community members and staff will be able to attend uh, that talks about all of the various different programs that we will be having or that are impacting us this year and how it kind of uh, moves in our district and, and what are some of the um, great work that staff is doing in relationship to ensuring that we make that shift in an effective, uh, in a systemic manner. So um, we've been doing a lot of work on that, so hopefully we'll see you at um, Cabrillo on November 4th and Ocean Shore, Ocean Shore on November 7th. 7th, both at 7 p.m. So that, and then our work study is November 6th, so we're, we're really sort of concentrating our efforts at, in, in November. Okay, thank you. Uh, district business uh, and a single plan for student achievement. All right, so um, I'd like to, on behalf of the principals, express our appreciation for um, the board's um, attention and the opportunity to talk about the plans at the work study last Wednesday and to get feedback from the trustees. Um, we've been very pleased with the progress of the schools. There's a focus at every school on the shift to the Common Core standards and developing students' capacities with the five Cs. Um, the school single site plans have um, laid out specific goals and activities that are in keeping with their school character, students' needs, and consistent with our 21st century education framework, strategic plan, and companion plans. And so um, with that, I'd like to recommend that the board approve the single plan for student achievement for all six of our schools. The principals are here tonight, and um, if you have any comments or questions for them, they are happy to answer them. Comments, questions? I just say thank you very much for all the work that goes into this, and I appreciate the budget piece of it because I think it reflects how much support we get from our community, our, our PTOs. And we, we always talk about our budget, but we have this like, other entity, both the Education Foundation and our PTOs, which, imp which provide program that we can't provide through programs. And so it's really helpful to see that, and I think it's helpful for the community as well to understand that to provide the quality program that we have takes us total community support. Did you have a motion? Um, did you have I, I was going to move with deep appreciation that we <laughs> approve the SIPSAs for uh, all of the schools. Okay. Second. All in favor? 
passes by vote. Thank you. Since we grilled you for hours last time, <laughs> you could probably slide out the door now. <laughs> See the rest of the basement. Okay, uh, 10B, first quarter report on Williams' complaint. Okay, I'm happy to report for the first quarter of 2013-14. There are no complaints with student textbooks and instructional materials, teacher vacancy or misassignment, or the facility conditions. Uh, 11 uh, A, uh, BP 5145.4, gender non-discrimination. Okay, so tonight we are going to be um, looking at Assembly Bill 1266. This was recently adopted by California legislature, um, and it will um, go into effect as of January 1st, 2014. And it states, a pupil shall be permitted to participate in sex segregated school programs, activities, and facilities, including athletic teams and competitions consistent with his or her gender identity, identity irrespective of the gender listed in the pupil's records. So how this will apply at our school sites is what we are going to um, discuss tonight. We have John Niblin here. He's our chief deputy county counsel and he's going to make a brief presentation for the board tonight on AB 1266, and he's here to answer any questions that the board members may have about the law. Also, County Council has provided for the board a model policy for us to uh, review for future use. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I had a PowerPoint presentation. Is that uh, something we can pull up? Yes. Yeah. Thank We're you. Um, and again, I'm John Niblin. I'm uh, with the Office of San Mateo County Council, and it is a definite uh, pleasure to be here as a, as a Pacifica resident and somebody who's had the uh, uh, privilege and pleasure of working with the district for the last uh, gosh, 10 or 12 years. I wanted to take a couple minutes and uh, acknowledge my colleague, uh, Kathy Miola. She's uh, with the Office of County Council. She's newly appointed as the lead uh, uh, Deputy County Council for Schools. So uh, she's somebody who I hope and expect will have, thank you, uh, the opportunity to work with you all on, on issues as they come up. Uh, Ray and I um, uh, started discussing this, I'd say, probably within the last couple of weeks. It's a relatively new law. It was, uh, and I, I think actually we might have had the opportunity to discuss it uh, in, in another context, a very similar presentation. Uh, Trustee Gould and I have uh, had to sit through uh, myself and uh, Ms. Miola. Yeah, I had to. It was required to sit, sit <laughs> through the... Um, uh, a similar presentation, but uh, we'll try to uh, uh, perhaps elaborate some. We didn't have as much time uh, uh, as we probably would have liked to cover some of the, uh, the matters that we uh, hopefully will be able to talk a little bit about today. Uh, in any event, uh, just to provide a little bit of the background so that uh, we know kind of what we're building on. Uh, prior to uh, AB 1266 being adopted, this is the lay of the land. This is what the existing law was. I mean, there was already uh, provision in the education code requiring that classes be conducted without regard to sex of the pupils enrolled in the class. Uh, also a requirement that districts not prohibit a student from enrolling in any class because of a student's sex, uh, with an exception for sex education and HIV awareness classes. Those could be done on a sex uh, uh, segregated basis, but broadly speaking, home ec, or things like that have been available to students uh, of either gender. Um, and you couldn't require a particular student to enroll in a particular course uh, uh, based on gender unless it was uh, something required of both genders. So you couldn't make all the female students do keyboarding or the male students do wood shop or whatever the stereotypes we might carry in our, in our brands. Um, <clears throat> a requirement, as you can see, to uh, uh, require essentially equivalent vocational school or program school program guidance uh, regardless of gender uh, a requirement that uh, you affirmatively explore the possibility of non-traditional courses or careers for pupils regardless of gender uh, and again uh, requirements around PE sort of the notion that uh, uh, programs be available programming be available uh, equivalently so why AB 1266? What was the legislature trying to do in adopting this uh, legislation? Uh, Assemblymember Amiano, who I believe is out of San Francisco, um, his goal 
was to, uh, well, this is what he stated. And, you know, it basically, current law, in his perspective, was deficient in that it did not provide specific guidance about how to apply the mandate of non-discrimination in sex-segregated programs, activities, and facilities. So you can see that maybe uh, that the education code already contains some provisions. His perspective was that we need to be clearer about what we do with respect to transgender students. And that's what we were trying to do with AB 1266, uh, clarify again what the Ed Code already has, at least in the perspective of the uh, bill sponsor. Uh, some members of the legislature were of the view that uh, students, transgender students who were denied access uh, to um, facilities on the basis of their gender identities were suffering physical and academic harm. Students who weren't using the bathroom, for example, because they only wanted to use the bathroom to correspond to their gender identity as opposed to their actual um, uh, physical gender uh, that could cause medical problems. Uh, alternatively, kids who were not, you know, going to their PE classes because they didn't want to change in a male locker room if they were perceiving themselves as female, notwithstanding male physical uh, uh, gender. So uh, that was part of what the legislature was trying to accomplish. So as Ray has already said, this is what AB 1266 does. It makes a change to the education code to, to, and the quoted, indented quoted text is really the key text that we'd be focusing on here. A pupil shall be permitted to participate in sex segregated school programs and activities, including athletic teams and competitions, and use facilities consistent with his or her gender identity, irrespective of the gender listed on the pupil's records. So that's what we gotta try to figure out then, or what, with all due respect, you all have to try to figure out is, you know, how you take that mandate and turn it into policies on the ground. Um, the law doesn't specifically indicate how a student establishes gender identity that is distinct from the gender listed on a pupil's records. And to the extent that we've gotten some feedback, Kathy and I and some of our colleagues have had the opportunity to go out and make some presentations uh, at some of the high school districts and some other elementary districts. And some of the feedback we're getting is, well, how do we know that somebody is sincerely sort of uh, identifying as a, as a gender different from theirs? Is it enough that they just show up one day and say, you know, today, you know, I'm feeling different? Or, or does it require you know, something more. Um, the authorities that I've reviewed and what I consider to be sort of the best practice on the basis, again, what I've seen in the field is that a school district uh, may look to the extent to which the student has exclusively and consistently asserted gender identification that's different from their physical gender. And we've incorporated that concept into the policy that we've um, put before you all. Um, it's important, though, to, to flag that um, others don't necessarily agree with that. Others have said that it would be uh, improper to require exclusive or a consistent assertion of uh, gender, that in fact there are some students who are working through gender issues and gender identity issues and may frankly uh, shift kind of day to day in terms of where he or she you know, views themselves being. So that's an open issue and one that I think is appropriate to flag. I just wanted to let you know that the policy that we put in front of you kind of opts for the first just because it provides us with a little more of an anchor against which to you know, analyze things. So in terms of compliance with the law, it's a new law, as, as we've noted. Um, so one of the issues that has been brought to us and we've been thinking about is, well, what do we do when other pupils protest? So um, this might be in the context of maybe locker rooms, bathrooms, sports teams, situations where you've got a student who sincerely, exclusively, and consistently identifies as female, notwithstanding male physical gender, wanting to use the female locker room, parents perhaps having some issues with that. I think that's a... That's something that we need to sort of have out there and think about. Uh, given the, the, the recent, you know, adoption of this law, there aren't any cases yet interpreting it. Um, we think it's likely uh, that courts will get involved uh, in, in sort of figuring out how this ultimately ends up uh, uh, applied. And it's also fair to say that there's relatively little in the way of official guidance. We've gotten some interim uh, guidance from CSBA. Ray and I have had a chance to talk some about that uh, with Dr. Tukloff, and uh, uh, we're still trying to, yeah, there's going to be more coming down the, down the pike, I think that's fair to say. Um, it's also worth noting that LA Unified, Oakland Unified, San Francisco Unified have for some number of years actually um, operated under policies similar to those policy, uh, the policy that we put in front of you all for consideration. Uh, in fact, we um, looked very closely at things they've done, and the feedback that we've gotten from those districts is that they've not had huge problems in terms of implementation of their policies. Um, that 
may or may not be completely relevant in the sense that we're dealing with different communities and different circumstances, but again, worth noting. Um, also, as we tr figure out how we're going to comply with the uh, Assembly Bill, we'd want to look at the legislative history because that can sometimes give us some sense of what the courts might do if and when um, there are challenges uh, around this law. And finally, uh, in terms of recommendation, as, as Ray and I talked about sort of the, the approach, we, we thought it really made sense to try to um, develop an individualized approach given sort of the, the fact that each kid is a, a little bit different, each kid's circumstance is going to be a little bit different. It's really going to be important in, in our perspective that uh, the policy reflect um, individualization, flexibility at the school site so that uh, we are, have the ability to be malleable around uh, differing um, circumstances. Legislative history is something I mentioned before. What exactly do I mean by that? And broadly speaking, when we're talking about legislative history, we're talking about sort of the committee reports, the, the correspondence from bill sponsors, supporters, opponents, that are all kind of available in the, the record that they keep in Sacramento. These aren't actually stated in the law. They're just sort of uh, correspondence back and forth that led up to the adoption of the law. And we oftentimes look to that to give us a sense of, you know, what the legislature was thinking as they adopted the law. Um, it's not dispositive. It's, it's, it's merely um, a source of information. And when you've got sort of vague situations, ambiguous situations, sometimes we look to that. And the courts sometimes give it some weight. So um, uh, when we look at the legislative history here, uh, one of the things that we note is that the legislative history did make specific citations to the experience in San Francisco Unified and LA Unified and the policies they have. And that's why we thought it was prudent as a starting point to look at you know, policies from those areas as, as you all are sort of thinking through what you want to do. Um, we note that both those districts have similar policies for locker room accessibility, which allow transgender students to use locker rooms corresponding to their gender identity asserted at school. And that, again, is something you'll see reflected in the policy that we've um, developed for your consideration. Um, that said, both those districts take into consideration available accommodations and the needs and privacy concerns of all students concerned. So, you know, we think based on that, there's, a, there's some support for the proposition that we can, again, take this individualized approach and consider the totality of the circumstances and everybody's interests as we try to address this concern and this, uh, this implementation of this law. Um, and the legislative history does note that a question has been raised as to whether we can continue to have these sorts of alternatives. Um, I think it's fair to say the legislative history is a, a little fuzzy even on this point. I mean, uh, there are some people who are sort of of the view that the mere fact that somebody's uncomfortable doesn't mean that uh, they sh you know, have any right to keep an another student from exercising their rights. So this is an area, again, where I think it's going to require uh, a lot of uh, analysis and individual attention at the school site level. And again, this is a little bit more on what I was saying before, uh, the fact that some uh, folk have taken the position that subjective discomfort in the pre presence of transgender students does not create a protected privacy interest. That, again, is something you'll see in the legislative history. And you've also got legislative history that sort of suggests that an other analyses might be appropriate. Sports programs, another place where I think you'll, it's likely there might, you, you could get some, um, some concerns expressed. Uh, sort of the notion, again, that you have a student who is physiologically a male who wants to participate on a female team and what impact that might have. Uh, the legislature did note that the California Inter Interscholastic uh, Federation has already adopted uh, a bylaw that, that indicates that all students should have the opportunity to participate in activities in a manner that's consistent with their gender, gender identity, which again suggests that that's going to be the likely direction um, courts might go if this was ever subject to um, uh, analysis or challenge. So uh, not dispositive, but worth noting. Um, finally, as we sort of uh, bring this to a conclusion, some of the takeaways, as I've already indicated, this is a new law. There isn't much guidance out there. Uh, you think we tend to think it would be a wise thing for districts to adopt a policy to provide overall guidance to school site personnel, um, but at the same time, district administration would likely want to consider developing a tool to assist school sites to, to figure out how to apply this particular policy with respect to any given student that's uh, it, sensitive to the school site, the individual needs of the particular student. Um, but bottom line, uh, and, and importantly, transgender students need to need access to activities, programs, and facilities consistent with their asserted gender identity. It's okay to offer alternative facilities 
but we may find ourselves with some risk if we um, ultimately mandate it against uh, you know, a student's desires. So uh, that's what I put together for uh, this evening. If there are any particular questions, I'd be happy to, um, happy to address them. Yes? PE testing. Yes. Don't we test girls differently than boys? There's a different standard. Is that not correct? How fast? How many laps? How fast? Huh. So my question is, because testing is always my favorite thing, <laughs> um, that how do we do that? Well, that's a, it talks about facilities and activities. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. I would tend to think that, frankly, probably the best way to address that would be uh, to really defer to the school site to develop on a case-by-case -case basis an analysis of whether it's appropriate okay. to uh, apply you know, a different standard with respect to a particular child. Um, I think that's something that... Uh, ought to be looked at probably on a case-by-case -case basis and uh, with again with deference to uh, to the particular tool that we've sort of put to put to you for a consideration mm -hmm. yes does our board policy have to have that part about exclusively and consistent consistently asserted or can we do a policy that doesn't have that language because it's not Kind of well, it's kind of not well defined, and as you know, having having had experienced more, yeah, you know, like uh, more than than one transgender teenager right. uh, that I've worked with, um, you know, that transition it doesn't happen overnight for anybody. And sure, you know, so you 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 know, okay, when they're a freshman, and you see that transition over many years, so you know, exclusively and consistently asserted, it, I don't think it happens. Yeah. There has to be room for testing. Uh, yeah. Well, well. To, to answer your question, uh, no. The the policy does not, in fact, need to have that uh, exclusively and consistently language in there. And in fact, that's why I, I thought it was appropriate to flag it because, frankly, there is a school of thought that uh, runs along the lines you're articulating there, and you, you know, sort of drawing from your own experience. So, uh, if the board wanted different language in there. Um, you know, it, we could certainly um, work with the board to, to pick up a better, you know, sort of a, a concept or that, that's more consistent with where the board wants to be on that. So that's not in any way mandatory. It was just kind of where we started in terms of uh, uh, putting something in front of you. So is there, uh, uh, a potential position that you would like to? Uh, I, I would second on that. I think that, that you need to leave room for children who are questioning or, or testing or, you know. Well, something more like sincerely or, or, or. I mean, I'm uh, not sure what the right term is, but, yeah, but you know, there, there are those kids out there that, that you know, like Andrea says, it, that it's not just, you know, I wake up tomorrow and I'm going to be the opposite gender. Sometimes they, they question, they test, yes. they go back and forth, and you have, there has to be room for them to fit in. I certainly see, uh, and perhaps what I could do by way of a, a takeaway is um, do a little bit of uh, research on, you know, other policies that might exist out there that might more adequately kind of, kind of capture that concept of right. students who are sort of exploring their, you know, their sexuality or, or, or sort of in the process of trying to um, identify what their, you know, sort of uh, sexuality is in terms of yeah. preferences. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think. Well, I guess my question is whether these words exclusively and consistently in, and consistently, pardon me, do they uh, do they come from psychology in any way? I mean, I sort of feel like this is not the, the idea of how how a transgender student should be defined and how we should determine who is uh, you know who's who's uh, appropriate to, for this law to apply to. I feel like should come sort of at least partly from you know from from the psycholo from the yes. psychologist. So I, I'm I'm wondering like if if that. Is, if that's not where these terms come from, then can we find alternative terms that seem to reflect better, um, you know, the work of people who work for many, many years with transgender kids and have a better idea of how to determine if, uh, you know, if a student is sincere um, about that. You know, and I do think, like, it's not, I think it's not unreasonable that we should apply some kind of bar that a student should, should have to clear to, you know, to be allowed to, to do this. We, you know, like, and I, I understand, I, I wouldn't 
want anybody to, you know, I wouldn't want anybody to be hurt by feeling that we didn't think that they were not sincere in doing it. But on the other hand, like it's, you know, like in terms of protecting the privacy of all students, like I think, you know, I think that um, everybody else in the locker room or the bathroom has some, you know, some right to know that there has some, there's, there's been some process that has been gone through that indicates that, that this person is sincere. There, you know, that when in talking to kids that now are now adults that have transitioned, they said the bathroom was the worst part of high school, of mm -hmm. their four years of high school. The bathroom, of course, that's was true. That's true for most. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Regardless, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think we, you know, high school is a little different situation than middle schools too. I mean, I, I think. Middle schools that I mean, just teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Whew, big span between where they're at from being little kids to you know, young young adults or kids in adult bodies. Um, so I think if you know, really thinking about this from a middle school perspective, I think that they are really questioning everything, and I think it's a little more fuzzy. In mid, I would assume it's a little more fuzzy for kids in middle school than it, you know, as you get older and progress through high school. I think. You, kind of figure yourself out. So I think we do have more fuzziness because of the age group that we're dealing with in terms of them being able to exclusively and consistently know what their ideas are. I, um, so I think we need to kind of think of it from that perspective. Um, and, and yet, I guess at the same time, you know, how, I mean, I'm thinking of some of the boys I have in my classroom that, you know, who, 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 who are kind of jokesters and pranksters and you know, p want to push the limits of what they can really do or not do, as the case may be. So, uh, yeah, I think I think we need to take into account that kids are trying to figure this out, particularly in middle school. But mm -hmm. I agree with Matt that there needs to be some level of decision and process. Yeah, and, and to be clear, I don't I don't really see this as a, as a policy with potential for abuse. Like I haven't heard any. I mean, I I've. I know what people say that they are concerned about, but I have not heard any evidence that it has ever actually occurred. And if I'm incorrect about that, I'd love to hear it. But I don't, I don't really, I don't really see this as something that that uh, kids would actually abuse on a practical on a practical level. Like I don't think that would ever happen. And I, I would assume that there's going to be some type of process, like the kids or, or family would need to contact the office or counselor or somebody, <coughs> that they're not going to just wake up that morning and say, I can't go into the girls' locker room today. Right. Well, I, I think that part's true. I, I did want to address uh, Trustee Levy's um, comment. I, I think when this law was first adopted, I, I must say that we probably got one or two calls uh, from school sites at the high school level um, where students kind of heard about it. and not really fully understood it even though some student who had indicated that oh you know I'm I'm a homosexual therefore I should be able to go into the you know girls locker room it had nothing to do with homosexuality this has everything to do with transgender uh, students so there was a so I think once the novelty of the of the law passed on though I mean your, I think your point is a good we haven't I think it's fair for us to, to share that we haven't uh, been bombarded with a bunch of questions or about students who are you know making false claims in order to you know, and, access and the San Francisco policy goes back to like 1990 or something it's, it's not been around that's, quite a while. that's almost 25 years I mean I think you know there there has been ample opportunity um, for, for them to see how that's right shaken out and I've haven't right. heard a huge right and they in fact do use that um, sort of exclusive and, and consistent language they do in, in San Francisco stuff. yes in fact um, the um, I'm sorry there was another comment that I but uh, to the point of whether or not there ought to be um, what we had contemplated, I think it would be the sort of the notion that you would in fact have a team at the school site level that would come together around a student who had expressed uh, these kinds mm -hmm. of concerns so that y in fact that's exactly right. It wouldn't be a situation where a light just turns on. The, the notion is you'd pull something like a student success team together, uh, uh, something analogous to that to, to sort of talk through a specific plan for that youngster to make sure that we're honoring his or her, you know, desire for privacy, what kinds of things that that student feels like he or she needs in order to um, be successful. We have provided, I believe in the attachments, um, a sample of what that could look like. So, it, yeah. yeah. Okay. John, could you expound on that? Uh, just so I clear I understood you that 
you're saying that San Francisco, which has had this policy for a long time, does have that more restrictive language? It, it does. It does. But it is also fair to say, as it was pointed out, this is a, a policy of long standing. Uh, and, you know, I think some of the thinking around, uh, I'm not sure the last time it was edited or, or you know, reviewed or, or modified. Um, but yes, it, it has had that language uh, for, for a long time. And then secondly, not to put them on the spot, but since we have all our principals in the room, I <laughs> wondered if there's any, any, any points that you all think of for, I mean, because you're the ones that are going to have to make this work of concerns for us to reflect in the board policy. I would just say that I appreciate the idea that teams coming together. I think there's a lot of valuable professionals that can add to the picture when a decision like that is trying to be made. Right. Yeah, and I, I think it would only come up really in the middle school because it's the only time that we really change or something. I mean, that's, a, that's only a one. Really? I mean, I've, well, seen, I've seen it. I've seen it in school but where kids have questioning their identity. But as far as like where they need to like have uh, restricted facilities or something because they need to change for PE or something, that doesn't really happen. But uh, my experience has been in middle school, so I don't. But I, I would appreciate it being site based and team based decision. I think that. I would think the bathroom issue would be more prevalent at, at, at every school because I know my wife teaches kindergarten and had a transgender kindergartner last year. Oh, really? So, yeah. wow. And lots of discussions on how to how to address it. Well, there's only one bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a transgender bathroom. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I don't even think of that. I mean, certainly there's bathrooms like in the nurses' room or areas. Well, we've had an opportunity to, to review, um, you know, I was looking at an article from the American Bar Association. This is actually an issue of, of nationwide significance. And frankly, even aside from uh, the, the state law, the, the, the federal government, the uh, Office of Civil Rights has looked at some cases and determined that transgender students um, under existing federal anti-discrimination laws may be entitled to some of the kinds of accommodations that we are talking about here as a matter of state law. So uh, the point of raising the article, though, is that it was discussing children who were very young, uh, you know, kindergarten, first, second, third grade. So it is something that um, I think just in terms of the way uh, society is uh, evolving and, uh, you know, sort of thoughts on you know, raising children, a lot of parents are at a very much earlier point um, working with their, with their youngsters to to address their uh, gender identity issues. So uh, again, we're looking at a lot of cases involving much younger children, um, certainly in some of the literature I've reviewed prior to coming here today. So, um, so some, some people don't, uh, when they leave home, they take on their other identity and they come to school and they, you know, they, they live their school day as one identity, but when they go home, they have to, to be the identity that the parents accept. And it seems that under this, the, those kids wouldn't be protected from any kind of discrimination because it's not, you know, the family hasn't come in and said, we want mm. your, this kid mm. called a he mm. instead of a she, or? Mm. Well, I, I think the, the policy itself uh, talks about the gender uh, identity that the student uh, expresses at school. Um, so that's really the environment that we're concerned about. And if we haven't been careful enough in making that point, I, you know, I appreciate your uh, raising it because, again, I think certainly our intention in drafting was to be clear that gender identity at school is, is really what we were trying to pick up because I certainly, um, the scenario you're proposing is, is really relevant and we need to make sure we address it. Uh, and we certainly wouldn't want sort of the, the notion of pulling together a team, uh, you know, the lack of parental participation being something that would prevent the team from coming together and um, sort of thinking through, you know, what needs to be done in order to protect a child uh, from discrimination and, and honor his or her sort of rights under, uh, under the assembly bill. Uh, you know, it's. I mean, ha I think we have a we have a fair amount of expertise in the district in terms of in terms of what the language might be and what the how the team might be. Like, I'm assuming that this. You know, I'm assuming that like you know, Robin and Megan and the psychologists have kind of been over all this. So maybe if we are if we are potentially looking for alternatives to exclusive and consistent, um, maybe they can help us. You know, with some suggestions in that, you know, in that area, since I I wouldn't sort of presume to guess at what an appropriate language would be for that. Yeah. 
Anyone else? Great. Well, again, I really appreciate you. the opportunity to come and visit with you this evening. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so this was a uh, first reading of this board policy. So, so bring it. Everybody's sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Safety Sorry. <in> numbers. Sorry. <laughs> Would it be? Um, should we bring it back for a sep how would we do that sandy bring it back for a separate second reading just well, do we need so that we can discuss the words that we find mm -hmm. and then we'll just keep it as a separate item and not put it on consent so that we could have discussion around it should yeah. we want to? yeah yeah that i think like a good just idea. bring yeah. it back under board policies again we yeah. just could put information slash reading and, or okay, and but, we have just but, it, but it will be a second reading at that point so yeah. it could be we could do go for all. action if you want to just modify it you know we'll mm -hmm. do our best and okay. then if so we can bring it back as as a so information yeah. slash action item Right. Mm -hmm. That's the way we bring it back. Right. The second, the second room, so we can just take action. Right. But it, on the, on, I think on the board pass, it has to say action. Mm -hmm. well, no, I, I just think I think I would be more comfortable if it came back just for information. Okay. I mean, okay. Because I think there is a potential for lots of different people to be interested in it, and it could be used to look at it again fresh with what a recommendation is and then come back a third time. Okay. So that if anybody's got any issues, then they've got an opportunity to come forward. Takes effect January one. Mm -hmm. so we, we have we have so time. So we have time. Yeah. All right. Now, were we comfortable with the plan as well? The way it, you know, this would. Oh, the, the document. Right. Yeah. The student study. I did want to also suggest, you know, since since it sounds like you know people are con are concerned with some justification that exclusive and consistent might in some cases be like too too high a standard, but you know we could sort of abdicate some of that to the principals. I mean, we could say like you know, I, and I don't know how this would be written legally, but that's something that I guess we would just to say like you know exclusive and consistent, but nothing written in here doesn't say that like the principals can't use their judgment. You know, I mean, right. I think that uh, it sounds like the board is comfortable with you know with, with saying that we don't you know we don't necessarily need to set exactly where that bar is going to be so we could decide what we sort of consider to be like you know a minimum standard and then if the principals you know and then the principals would use their judgment beyond so presumably that. they would know they would the know the child than right i mean yeah it's, it seems hard to you know apply any standard that could be you know applicable 100 percent of cases you know, I, with an issue like this. Yeah, right. I like that idea. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, chances are there's going to be some court cases and stuff mm -hmm. coming down the pike where this is going to, this will come back to us because there have been required modifications to be made, you know. The chances of us getting it, you know, in sync <laughs> with a future court decision is probably unlikely. Just, yeah. But in the meantime, yeah, I, mean, no, no, I agree with you. I think, I, I think to, it's, you know, we should, yeah, I think by definition, any kid who's in this position is going to be needing support and and that's what we tremendous, want to make sure tremendous yeah support. that's what we want to make sure they get and it's less about the language and the policy and more about what principals and the staff can provide mm -hmm. and that's that's the goal thank you anything else okay uh 11b uh, ar 4161.11 4261.11 4361.11 <laughs> Industrial accident and illness leave. We don't want any. We're against it. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't want this to happen to any of our employees. Um, but what we did find in our current contract language, uh, <coughs> item that we're suggesting to strike out is um, not in current practice. So that's why we're suggesting that we strike out that item. Um, and current practice is to allow for uh, an employee to get immediate assistance if they were in an industrial accident. So what um, the suggestion in the CSBA sample is recommended, we, we don't currently practice that. So you're saying our practice is, regardless of how long they've served or been an employee with us, the policy applies? Correct. Okay. And that goes for classified certificated managers. Questions or comments on that? Seems reasonable to me. Okay. 
so that'll come back to cons on consent. Mm -hmm. yes. okay. okay. Future agenda items. Okay. So Okay, I believe um, Ray is requesting for us to add an agenda item for January, is that correct? Yes, please. Okay, and that would be to bring back the inclusion definition for Pacifica mm -hmm. School District. So we'll do that at the January meeting. And how is, is that defined in a board policy or how, how do we currently well, not define it at all? We're introducing the definition um, for your review. Okay. So the... Um, advisory committee um, I by January I will have met with them they will come up with their final draft of an inclusion definition for Pacifica School District and so in January you will get it for your first review. Okay. In the definition of inclusion being how kids are fully included, included partially included or what what it well, right now the the definition is in draft form and it's in very general terms. Okay. And and I think it, it really was to bring clarity to to the team when we're talking about inclusion in our district. Okay. Because everybody has their own, own particular yeah. good idea notion. Okay. Okay. And what that looks like is different from different perspectives. Okay. I got you. Okay, that would be all. For future agenda. Mm -hmm. We're adjourned at 7:48. Yay, Mr. President! Wow. 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 Very impressive. Wow.